Well, good morning. It is certainly wonderful to be with you again. It's been more than two years since we were in this room. Wow. I'm Douglas, that's Vicki, and uh, indeed very, very happy to be here. But in the meantime, I'll give you greetings from Livingston, uh, where we live, and also from the churches in Honolulu and Monterrey, Mexico. I uh, also want to say hello to you. Yes. And also the fellowship in Atlanta. We just uh, were recently in the United States, and uh, we're with a lot of our brothers and sisters over there. It's been a great time to uh, worship with them, but also to bring greetings from across the pond. Keep going, baby. Yeah. You're doing so great. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Yay! Oh, oh, right. 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 <laughs> and uh, and the, the beautiful woman in the middle, uh, that's our dog, Darcy. Oh. She says hello as well. Oh, I, yes. I don't know if she's allowed in a double tree. <laughs> she would love to be here, I'll tell you that much. It's a, so, greetings internationally. And I feel like that a lot. We're just singing with Chicago Church. Mm -hmm. And the one before, it looked like it, it looked like it was the Philippines. Yes. yes. Yeah. We recognize those guys. I'll be there in a few weeks, actually. Wow. Uh, we're going to talk about Holy Week. Amen. Of course, in the Christian calendar, like the Jewish calendar, there's a flow. If you were Jewish, you would know these events. You would certainly know the three required events that all, all men were required to attend in the year. But you would know the other ones as well, and you would know the order. In the Christian calendar, now look, in the early church, and as far back as we can go was the second century. The only thing in the calendar that I'm aware of was Easter. That was the number one event. But in the early Middle Ages, a kind of calendar evolved, and church seasons, the most important of which, of course, is Holy Week. And Lent starts on Ash Wednesday, about six weeks or so before, and, uh, and ends, and we are in Holy Week right now. Actually, technically, it's the day after Holy Week, but we're going to include that in there for the, these purposes. So we're going to be talking a little bit about Palm Sunday, that is the triumphal entry, all the way to the resurrection, and we've got lots of cool things to share with you, but for the moment I'm going to turn it over to Vicki. Okay. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about Holy Week, um, and, it, and it's actually going to be from a children's book. Oh. Uh, I, for many years, have helped uh, with children's Christian education. And I remember we came up to, we were coming up on Easter, and someone asked me, how do you explain Easter to a child? Mm -hmm. The cross is very brutal, and it's very violent, and it doesn't make any sense to our children. It doesn't often always make sense to us. And it really got me thinking, and I found this book, which is all about Holy Week, you know, when, when you think about Holy Week, it's probably the longest week of the year. What they went through walking with Jesus. I mean, they start off with the anointing in Bethany, which we don't have up here. Then they come to this triumphal entry. And it's just, there was such tremendous excitement. And the emotion and the excitement of Jesus coming in on a donkey. And Jesus entered Jerusalem for the Passover feast. That Passover was set in stone. They looked forward to it all year. And they traveled from their villages up into Jerusalem. And we say up, they were probably traveling down <laughs> geographically, but they're going up, up the hill. And then the crowd gathered there to see him waving the palm branches. Doug showed you a picture and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So you've got this tremendous excitement. If you've been there waving the branches, maybe that's like, New here, here, where you were able to walk down the, the, the Royal Mall with the torches, you know. <laughs> I was signed up for that this year, and then it didn't happen at the end of last year. They did give me a refund, but, you know, I was so disappointed. But, you know, that kind of excitement of being in a crowd, and it, it was so exciting in that we explained that to our children. And then he enters Jerusalem. He washes the disciples' feet. They have the Last Supper. They have that together. I think I've got something to share about that. Um, all right, before the Last Supper, Jesus is there. He enters Jerusalem, but there's an anger with him when he finds out that they've turned the, the house of the Lord into a den of robbers. You know, Jesus is there. He wants to be there to heal and to teach, but others were there making a mockery out of the temple system. And we see Jesus being angry and disappointed so we've gone from such a high to such a low. And then as we were just sharing about the Passover feast, Jesus is there, he washes the disciples' feet. 
And he does it as an example for us, so that we'll serve each other. But you think of that, them being at that last supper, having their feet washed by Jesus, trying to put all of this stuff into perspective as they're coming up to Passover. And the next one, um, they take this meal. Jesus produces this incredible meal, and they're so thankful. But at the same time, they're probably a little perplexed because he takes the cup, he gives thanks, saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many so that their sins may be forgiven. That's from Matthew 26. So we then find ourselves that we know that Jesus is overwhelmed, he's now being betrayed, and we find him in the garden. Actually, that's just before the garden, isn't it? Uh, before his betrayal. But Jesus wants to go, he, he needs to pray. He's feeling overwhelmed that's all coming, of, by, of all that's coming together. And I think for us, when you start adding all these emotions, we don't always know where we find ourselves. So Jesus went to pray, telling his disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. He fell down and prayed, Abba, Father, take this cup away from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And then at the same time, I'm sure they've been feeling this. He's been arrested, he's taken to Pilate, and this is where before he gets thrown in the dungeon. I mean, these are all things that are happening in Holy Week. We find that they can't, Pilate can't find anything wrong with him, but he gives in to the pressure of the crowd. And somehow we find ourselves in that crowd. We're trying to think, where would I be? What would I be doing? What would I be feeling? But the people again demanded Jesus should be crucified, according to Luke 23. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. We then know he's thrown into the dungeon. Some of us have been able to see that. And then we go in on this longest day of Thursday going into Friday to the Passover where finally we see Jesus crucified. Jesus had to be scared. The disciples had to be scared. His family was scared. But then this terrifying event takes place where the earth shook Another account tells us the temple curtain was torn in two when he died. And the soldiers who were guarding Jesus were terrified, exclaiming, surely he was the son of God. Now we're in this Good Friday, this longest day, which I think Thursday, Friday, Saturday run in together. And that's where we find ourselves in the Holy Week, like and even yesterday, where we're just scared and we're sad because we relate to the people that Jesus had died. There was a sadness. He'd left. And the exhaustion of all these different emotions of Holy Week and the length of the week has really led them to be just on their own and isolated and decimated. And Doug is going to share about, obviously, the good news which we know of the resurrection. But Good Friday really is one of those days where it moves us nearer to God's plan of salvation. It's good news because we start to see about the forgiveness that Jesus predicted there. And his willingness, Jesus' willingness to surrender. You know, he surrenders in Gethsemane, but he also surrenders on the cross. And I think for me, I start to see all these emotions and realize it's about surrendering on a daily basis to God's plan. So what I'd like to do is just lead us in a prayer from Psalm 56. I think, to, and hopefully will help us connect even more to what has gone on in the, the days preceding the resurrection. Father, you are all-knowing. You know those who were against us. You knew those who were against Jesus Christ. But you are our God, our trust in trials and in temptations. Like David, we place our trust in you and ask we reflect your courage and not be afraid and that we contemplate all the things that have gone up in this holy week, the emotions, the fears, but also the victories. We thank you for your compassion and mercy, for your deep care and concern, that when we are alone or suffering or in pain, when our heart aches or we're brokenhearted, you are there. In Psalm 56, you count our tears. You collect and record our deepest sadness and hear our cries as you did all those years ago on Good Friday. You heard your son on the cross and delivered him for our salvation to bring peace and harmony for all mankind. 
God, you are worthy of our praise and hope, and our hope is in you alone. As we remember the cross, we remember Jesus, the Christ, your son, who surrendered in Gethsemane and on Good Friday. And we pray also that we will surrender and we will remember who you are and we will lift you up. We praise you and thank you for this holy week, for the emotions that are so very real and for the many myriad of things that we feel, but we pray that we will put our trust in you. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Vicki. We're going to have a lot of scripture now, and I hope that you're in a frame to learn. Amen. The first three songs we sang was Lion of Judah, that's from Genesis 49, as Jacob blesses his sons. Then we were in John 5, about waiting in the water, which is a baptismal song. And then we were in Psalm 1, trusting the Lord. The Lord. And the one we just sang, I think it's, it's kind of have tones of the epistles and of Revelation. But I want to talk about Holy Week. And the first day is Palm Sunday, which was last Sunday. And I don't know, did you have a message on Palm Sunday, last Sunday, in your congregation? So it would depend on, on, on yeah. the group. The one interesting thing that, that I, I learned just a, a couple months ago was, and I won't read this just for the sake of time, but uh, an ancient Jewish tradition that when the Messiah comes, if he's pleased with his people, he'll come in the clouds of heaven. But if he's not pleased, um, he'll be coming on a donkey. And I thought that was quite fascinating since Jesus came on a donkey, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, and yet he will come in the clouds of heaven. At least that's what he told the high priest, and that was what actually earned him his death sentence. But just fascinating things we could look at. Most New Testament scholars and historians believe the year of Jesus' death was 30. Uh, with the dates for the Roman uh, authorities and for the various Jewish people in authority, there are only two years that could work out in the 30s. That's 30 and 33. 33 is possible, but then Jesus is crucified after, you know, he's like around 37 years old if it's then. So 30 is much more like it. And if that's the case, then we can even give a date to Palm Sunday, April 2nd. Maybe that's your birthday. Maybe anyone born in April? <laughs> you might feel proud. Yes, I was born on the first Easter. He continues to preach. And in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can account for every day in Holy Week except Wednesday. Wednesday is just a mystery. There's nothing there. I don't know. Maybe that has implications for you for midweek. I don't know. But then you have Monday, Thursday. That's a strange word, but it comes from a Latin word referring to the mandate or the command to wash one another's feet as Jesus washed their feet. Because that's the day of the Last Supper. And then you've got Good Friday on April 7th, of course. Jesus is delivered to Pilate and then Herod and then back again. And then dark or silent Saturday where Jesus is in the underworld. And finally, Easter. And the first appearances that will be taking place over a period of uh, weeks, actually. Now, I want to look at the cross and then I want to look at the empty tomb. We're going to focus in the next few minutes on first Good Friday against the backdrop of Good Friday, then Easter actually is good news. Now we could look at Jesus' seven last sayings before the cross, but we won't do that. We could look at his seven last sayings after the cross, selected ones, like, woman, why are you weeping? Or, what were you talking about on the road? We're going to look, rather, at Jesus' seven sayings while on the cross. And they're short, and probably because it would be quite hard to you know, speak at length with that kind of torture. And just, by the way, the, uh, the evidence of crucifixion and crucified bodies and things that have been found by archaeologists is that the cross would have been this kind of cross, a tau cross. That is, it, has, it doesn't extend above the T, and that's important uh, because of the references in early Christian literature. They describe that kind of a cross. Later, in the Middle Ages, you'll get this kind of cross, the kind that that in my dreams as a little boy, I used to make to keep vampires away. <laughs> it never worked, probably because I was doing it wrong. <laughs> so it would have looked something like this. And from the crucified bodies that have been found, it's known that the nails, the feet were not overlapping, as I saw growing up in the Anglican church, but they were actually on different sides of the cross, with nails going through the ankle. We also see this from, uh, this is a graffito from Rome, it's a little hard to make out, but now it's a bit easier. Can you see? Yeah. You can see the Tau cross, uh, and you can see the Christian, and 
you can see that this is an anti-Christian graffito. And there are probably a lot of anti-Christian graffiti, but this one depicts Jesus as, as a jackass, at least from uh, the waist up. And it says, it's making fun of uh, the fellow, his name is Alexamenos. And it says, Alexamenos Sebete Theon, he's worshiping his God, this crucified animal. Reminds us of what Paul said, this is foolishness to Greeks, to, to pagans. So Jesus is on the cross when he says these seven sayings, and we'll, uh, we'll alight on every one of them. And they're in order. I think I've got them in the right chronological order. But as you can see, they're from more than one gospel. The first one, to me, is in some ways the most amazing. That he says, forgive them, but it's the second part that gets me. For they know not what they're doing. And for me being up there, I would say forgive them even though they know exactly, mm -hmm. perfectly well, and inexcusably, what they are doing. <laughs> he doesn't even, it, it, it's like he's giving, I mean, he's showing grace. He's not just thinking of them. But forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Whether it's the religious establishment, which on Palm Sunday he basically attacked as, as he cleansed the temple, or uh, the Romans themselves. And that's, that's good for me. But sometimes we want people to suffer. We had a reading a few minutes ago from 1 Peter 1. Uh, if you go to 1 Peter 2, which is also about the cross, it says that when he was insulted, he didn't respond with insult. When he was unjustly treated, he didn't lash back. Uh, how many of us have lashed back? Well, I can say, how many, how many of us have been unjustly treated even in a minor, in a minor way this week? Someone cut you off in traffic or misrepresented you, or I'm, I'm sure there's something. Now, our human tendency is, okay, hang on, let's just clarify here. Uh, I would, it was my idea, not his. Or, what are you doing cutting in front of me? I mean, you didn't even signal. You know, we want to make a point. Jesus didn't reply to violence with violence, but with love. And in the language of social media, he did not unfriend the people. <laughs> the second saying, he was crucified with two robbers. It's thought that they were more like revolutionaries. These were people who wanted to violently overthrow Rome. And one of them is penitent and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the other is just negative and cynical. He, you know, he doesn't believe it. Jesus says, truly, I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. Oh, he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. What, did Jesus go to heaven on Friday? No. According to the Gospels, he didn't ascend until, um, that didn't happen until quite a bit later. But even when someone held on to him on Sunday, he said, I've not yet ascended. The ascension actually is the 40th day. It's quite a bit later. Rather, Jesus visited the realm of the dead and made some kind of a proclamation. That realm is called Sheol in the Old Testament, Hades. Uh, the Greek word for the New Testament. And what the early Christians believe, as it says in John 3.13, no one has gone to heaven, no one's gone to hell. Hell doesn't exist yet, not until the end of time. There's no one in heaven or hell yet. Uh, but there are a lot of people in the realm of the dead. So that's where Jesus was. And that very day, he would be with the thief in the good part of the underworld, that is where the righteous are waiting. And that place is called paradise. The thief took responsibility God gives a last-minute reprieve. Too many people look at this and they think, this is just a frustrating passage because why isn't the thief baptized? And that's a very Christian question. And it's actually quite inappropriate because there's no Christianity yet. There are no Christians for a few more chapters, not until Acts chapter 2. He couldn't be baptized because baptism is a, is a participation in Jesus' death and resurrection. Plus, it would be very hard to baptize someone on a cross. Uh, so he saved as a faithful Jew. And it's a last minute reprieve. And I don't think the point is to, it's not so much a passage about how to be saved. It's a passage about the heart of God. And I would like to think that if, if I drifted, but I came back, even at the last moment, that there would be a loving God waiting to receive me. Now that's, you can't bank on that, because the problem with deliberately drifting is it destroys your motivation and your faith. 
But this does show us something about the heart of God. And I take it that way. Woman, behold your son. Jesus is addressing Mary, his mother, but he's looking at the one that John's Gospel says is the disciple Jesus loved. And then he says to the man, son, behold your mother. It's not clear that Jesus' own family are believers yet, especially his four brothers, who a few chapters earlier try to misadvise him. They're just coming to faith, or his various sisters. But here he wants probably the Apostle John to be uh, the one to take care of his mother. Who's standing around the cross, I ask? It's not the twelve, uh, maybe one of the twelve, but it's mainly the women which is fairly typical biblically, they're the ones in the right place, understand intuitively or otherwise before the men do, if the men ever do understand. Uh, this is a pattern you can prove in both testaments. But what's quite amazing, these first three sayings on the cross, I mean, what would, what would, you, what would it be if you were on the cross? Ouch! Or, you know, you'd be something like that, and uh, I mean, maybe you would see your mother, and you'd say, but his first three sayings are care for other people. He's not thinking about himself. Who is he thinking about? Well, the ones who are abusing him. Then he's thinking of the thief. And now he's thinking of uh, family. The fourth saying. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He's quoting from Psalm 22. Sometimes called the crucifixion psalm. I've run into writers and theologians who say that Jesus is giving up here. He thought that God, the Father, had given up on him completely. That wouldn't be quite right. Because you can't justify that interpretation unless you only read verse 1. As you read through Psalm 22, he speaks of enemies, he speaks of injustice, but it ends with a, a confident statement that I will... Once again, be in the congregation. I'll praise your name among my brothers. Verse 22. That passage is even quoted in the book of Hebrews. So Psalm 22 is, yes, it's a song of abandonment in one sense, but it's also a song of confidence that God will come through here. In other words, it's the perfect scripture for this amazing situation. As Jesus embraces the pain, he leans into it, but also he anticipates there will be victory. It reminds us to trust in God, even if God feels absent. The shortest saying, at least I think that's the shortest, I thirst. I thirst. Jesus shares about his thirst. He does that in John 4 with the Samaritan woman. But here, he's sharing about something, I mean, I mean just imagine how dehydrated and, and pain he would be. And here... The one who provides living water to quench our thirst. Now he himself is thirsting. That's the fifth saying on the cross. The sixth. <coughs> it is finished. It's a single word in the Greek New Testament. Katalistai. It is finished. As in, it is done. The bill is paid. It's finished. The work of salvation. And there's a, in, in John's Gospel, there are lots of verses, starting in chapter 2, uh, where you can see Jesus is aware of a certain time, a flow of time, a certain program. Not that different things had to happen on certain days, but, he, but things are working together towards a very specific goal. And if you look at those passages, you'll see that that theme of time is really important. And ultimately, he saves us. It is finished. It's not we finish, we save ourselves. Well, finally, I've done enough good deeds to to outweigh my bad deeds, so my conscience is okay again. In the world, I mean, this is the world of religious people, atheists, agnostics, this is the way people play in the world. They do something wrong, and then they may admit they've done wrong or may not, but they'll unconsciously almost try to do enough good deeds that now they feel, well, decently, they feel that they're respectable again. Somehow, we want to balance things out doesn't work that way. <clears throat> so the question to me is, am I seeking salvation outside of Christ? I'm trying to do it my own way. And the last of the seven sayings, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Here he quotes Psalm 31. And we see 
he said earlier in John, no one takes my life from me. Now, didn't someone take his life from him? Yes, okay. yeah, he's being executed. But his point was that he is consenting to give up his life. He knew he would die, he predicted it, just as he predicted his resurrection. And now, no one can take my life, but now it is time, since things are finished. And there are many things that we can uh, learn from the psalm that he quoted. And if you really want to get the background, you don't just read these seven lines in isolation. You look back at other connections in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And this shows us to trust God, not people, in our own pain, confusion, and even despair. How many of you have heard before the seven last sayings of Christ on the cross? You've heard of it? Some have and some haven't. Okay. Um, you could add an eighth, but this was the saying that was above the cross. And the saying above the cross, you can see, is in three different languages. Can you make it out? Jesus Nazarenus Rex Deorum. There's the Latin. Jesus, the Nazarene King of the Jews. In Greek, Jesus o Nazareos o Basileos ton Judaio. Exactly the same meaning. And then in the Hebrew, uh, Yeshua Hanatsuri u Melech Hayyudim. And that says, Jesus the Nazarite. This is probably referring to Isaiah 11 and 1, and King of the Judeans or the Jews. And that's the eighth saying. But that's really the saying that Pilate decided to leave above uh, the cross. Now, before we talk about Easter, I want to encourage you to remember those seven sayings and take a look at them later on. Because these can teach us not to give up on God, but to pray. And like Jesus, not to push others away, but even share them with people how we're feeling. And notice, he's in pain. He doesn't blame anybody. That's what I would do, of course. Maybe you would too. But we don't blame others when they don't meet our needs when we're in pain. The Lord will take care of that. And we get our perspective, we get our confidence from Him and from His Word. And that means allowing God to work in our lives in His own time. So there's great application here. Don't give up on God. Don't push others away. The Lord will meet our needs. Trust Him. Get the perspective from the Scriptures and allow God to work in our lives. Well, we have the Good Friday, as it's called. And then we have the Silent Saturday, the Dark Saturday where we know what Jesus' followers were doing. They were hiding. They're afraid, perhaps, lest something similar happen to them. And yet, amazingly, on the Sunday morning, the tomb is empty. And that's a fact that, e that nearly all historians and theologians agree on, even the ones who don't accept that the Bible is inspired. Even those who are atheists, and there are quite a few, believe it or not, <laughs> historians and even biblical scholars who don't believe in God, once had a debate with one of those. Uh, they, they don't believe it. They don't believe in God, but nearly all would say clearly the tomb was empty. That's quite interesting. What had gone on? Well, today is Easter. All over the world this is being celebrated, but not all over the world, because we follow the Western traditions, that is of the Catholics and the Protestants, the Eastern side, often it's a different day. But still, you know, there's Easter. Christ is risen, Christos Aneste in Greek. In Russia, maybe the Ukraine, they say Christos was Chris. We used to know was Chris. Yeah, that's the natural response. And, and uh, in, in Ukraine, uh, when, you, when you meet people on uh, Easter, you say uh, three times Christos was Chris, Christos was Chris, Christos was Chris, and another uh, reply you three times We used to know was Chris, we used to know was Chris, we used to know was Chris. Yeah, he's risen indeed. Uh, this tradition goes way back. Now, I don't know if it goes back to the first century, but it goes way back. And these are not bad things. So the cross is followed by a resurrection. And Jesus had three times at least prophesied, read the Gospels, that he would come into conflict with the establishment, they would arrange his execution, but that he would rise from the dead on the third day. So I'd like us to look at seven surprises from Easter. Um, and then we're talking a bit about skepticism. But first, the surprises, which we're just talking about right now. Historically, Easter has always been the most important Christian holiday. I mean, there was a Christmas in the 200s, but that's not even official to the 300s. And Christmas, I mean, it has some good points to it, even though 
for most people, it's not, it's more commercial than anything else. But Easter is a big deal. It was such a big deal that in the late second century, Christians had disagreements. Should we follow the Jewish lunar calendar or should we follow the solar calendar? And you know, how do we determine when Easter is? And, and there were people who felt very strongly about this who even thought that maybe if you're celebrating Easter on the wrong day, you're not a real Christian. Which, okay, you don't buy that, do you? I mean, surely that's a minor thing. But the point is that Easter was a major thing. Secondly, in many languages, Easter is called Passover. Easter is a European word from a pagan celebration. But in many languages, originally it's Pesach in Hebrew, Pascha in Greek, and in many European languages it sounds like one of those words. Tying in the Passover connection. Ali and Wendy had a picture from the Isle of Aaron that had a sheep. Uh, Jesus was a, a lamb without blemish. That sheep looked a little asymmetrical to me. Especially <laughs> <laughs> the black spotches of the Warshock patch it had on his forehead. So I don't know how I, I had mixed feelings about that sheep. <laughs> but anyway, Passover is a time of, of, of sacrifice of obviously an innocent lamb. What did he ever do to you? Or you could use a goat, technically, according to the Torah. But it's Passover. And so that encourages us to think of Easter and also even Lord's Supper, but certainly think of Easter in terms of Passover, which means you've got to get back into the Old Testament. Third, surprise. But, but this may not be a surprise to you, but of these seven surprises, most of you in the room will be surprised by at least one of them. And most people outside this room know very few of these, these points. Jesus experiences the first resurrection ever. And you might say, well, what about people in the Old Testament? Didn't Elijah raise someone from the dead? Yes. It wasn't a resurrection, though. Well, didn't Jesus raise the son of the widow of Nain? Her husband's dead. She has only one child. The child dies. This is in Luke 7. Yes, he raised her. If you want to call it resurrected, you can, but it would be quite misleading to say resurrected. Because resurrection has to do with the resurrection body. And in 1 Corinthians 15, we read that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. He's the first person to be raised from the dead, that is, with a resurrection body. A body that's indestructible. In this case, he could walk through a locked door. I don't, I don't mean like with a squat team going in front of him. I mean, he just <laughs> walks right through. Or he's walking on the Emmaus Road at the very end of Luke, and he's able to disguise himself, apparently without using some kind of cloak of invisibility, but they don't recognize who he is. And then that's why I says, so what were you talking about on the road? Who? Jesus of Nazareth? Who's that? You know, what? He died, really? You know, tell me more. Mm -hmm. Things like that. But he had a resurrection body. And this was hard for the ancient Jews to accept, because they believed that at the end of time, the Messiah would come and raise the dead. Everyone would be raised simultaneously for the judgment day. Christians believe that also. But here's one person being raised well before the judgment day. You know the judgment day hasn't happened because the occupying force, the Romans, are still there, among other things. We're still mortal, fourthly, until that general resurrection, as it's called, the resurrection of us, not Jesus, but our resurrection. We're mortal. Uh, it's a common teaching in most churches, and you'll hear this at funerals, you'll hear this in teaching days, that humans are immortal. Your soul is eternal. If your soul is eternal in that sense, it can never die, it's immortal, I would like you to show me just one passage in the Bible that teaches that. I don't know a single passage. I know passages that teach the opposite, though. That God alone is immortal. The idea that you'll live forever, no matter what, can't, comes in to Christianity through the Greek philosophers. It comes in more than a century after, probably a century and a half plus, after Jesus died. And then the thought is, well, you're going to live forever, uh, no matter who you are or what you do. And that's actually not a biblical doctrine. We're mortal. We can be clothed with immortality, but the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, for those who believe, is a gift. 
It's not a guarantee to those who don't believe. Fifth surprise, very small, but for me this was kind of a big thing. When I realized 10 or 20 years ago, reading through Matthew, that they posted a guard. There was a guard guarding the grave. Because they said, remember that deceiver, when he was alive, he said, oh, okay, let's make sure he doesn't pull a trick or, or his uh, disciples don't you know, pretend he's a, a, So they, they have a guard, a Roman guard at the tomb. But if you look carefully, that's not, uh, that guard's not assigned when Jesus is buried. It's assigned the next day, which is very interesting because if it's inauthentic, if that's just a detail thrown in there, because this is just a myth, you know, this never happened, then why would you assign it on Saturday? Surely you would have the guard on Friday from the beginning. Otherwise, it's an obvious weakness. You know, maybe they were guarding an empty tomb. <laughs> anyway, for me, that was uh, yeah. quite telling. And, and why, why should I believe it's on Saturday? Because they're, they're telling the truth honestly. If they were being dishonest, they would have put it on that, they would put it earlier on. It's a better story. Number six, the resurrection did not end the earthly ministry of Jesus. Now, if you read Luke, the longest gospel in the New Testament is Luke, uh, in chapter 24, you have his resurrection and walking along the Emmaus Road, and he meets the 12, and then at the end of Luke, He's at Bethany, and he ascends, and he rises to, goes to heaven. And so you might read that and think, oh, wow, that was a busy day, too. Rising and appearing and ascending back to heaven. But this is telescope. These events, as they often are in the Bible, are telescope. The, rest, the ascension is 40 days later. And we know that because in the next chapter of Luke, which is Acts 1, because it's the same author, in Acts 1, it says he was there for 40 more days, and then... He ascended. That is, his ministry wasn't just the three years or three and a half years or however you count it. It was that period of time plus 40 days of further training, which apparently his disciples needed. Imagine how it would feel to be instructed by someone who had not only risen from the dead, uh, but had conquered death and someone who was the Christ. And the ascension is important biblically because without the ascension and the accession to the throne, there would be no outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2. The last surprise, and I've hinted this already, and that is that even liberal or unbelieving scholars typically accept these three facts. That the tomb was empty, that Jesus was executed, and that the early Christians believed that he had risen from the dead. Now, don't mishear me. I'm not saying that unbelieving scholars admit that he rose from the dead. Right, because that wouldn't even make any sense if I said that. Unbelieving scholars even say, nearly all of them would say, the early Christians believed he had risen from the dead. Otherwise, how would you account for the radical transformation? Well, in their lives, going from timidity to boldness and the way that lives are transformed. We read about, we don't just read about, we see that in our, our time as well. So what's the best explanation? Someone who's executed, but then he's in the tomb, but then the tomb is empty, no one can find the body, and then his followers are transformed, and they're claiming not that they saw a ghost, that we saw Jesus the other day. No, this is not a ghost. This is someone who's alive. Ghosts are, if you believe in ghosts, that's dead people, right? This is someone who's alive. Someone who's alive. How do you account for that? Well, the best explanation is that he actually rose from the dead. You might come up with another one, but it won't be as, as convincing. So think about that. Seven Easter surprises. I hope at least one of those was a surprise for you. And I hope actually that all seven made you think some. We looked at the seven last sayings of Christ on the cross after we looked at the seven emotions of Holy Week. And then we looked at seven Easter surprises. And I want to close with some encouragement for those who may still be skeptical or not sure. And I've learned through the years that this is not, uh, oh yeah, um, some atheist was brought to church by her friend and you know she's sitting in the back like that. No, no, skepticism can be in the heart of someone who's been a Christian for decades. There can be skepticism. So this may help you. You may remember that one of the 12 apostles was named Thomas. 
Thomas volunteers to die with Jesus somewhere in the middle of John. And yet, after he rises from the dead, he's not so sure. Because Jesus appears to the twelve. Well, Judas is actually dead. The eleven. Well, actually the ten. Because Thomas wasn't present. This is Easter evening. Now, a week later, and, and he says, <laughs> unless I put my hand in his wound, unless I see him, no, I, 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 can't, I just can't commit myself to that. One week later, another appearance of Jesus. So it says eight days later. They're counting inclusively as they did back then. So this is uh, Sunday after Easter. His disciples are inside again. Thomas is with them this time. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Maybe because they're shaking so violently. <laughs> I mean, how would you feel? You know, peace be with you. Shalom, that's a normal greeting, but things are not normal. Thomas, he wanted to believe but it seems he could not fake it. And even someone who, uh, who had seen something amazing, who had been with someone amazing like Christ, couldn't doubt. Now, this is a famous painting, maybe you've seen it before. Mm -hmm. The Bible doesn't actually say that he put his finger in Jesus' wound. Uh, there's a problem with that. Actually, I think that wound's on the wrong side anyway. Plus, it's really unhygienic. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that at home. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. I don't know that you can settle it. I don't know that it's important. But I do know that that doubt is a big theme biblically. And I do know that there's a good kind of doubt and a bad kind of doubt. I think Thomas's doubt, that was the good kind of doubt. An honest reservation, not because he wanted to run away from the truth, but because he wanted to believe, and he just couldn't at that point. Some people doubt. It's their excuse. And even if you answer their question, they've got another question, and another, and another. And there's no real intent to follow the truth. It's more a path of self-justification. Well, Jesus appears, and he says, put your hand in my side, don't disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas simply falls down and says, my Lord and my God. But God understands our need for reassurance. Faith is something, it's a response to evidence, but it's also something that we can control. I know that may sound, that may be hard to process there, but faith is a response when we are convinced by evidence. And yet it's also relational. If there's a trust, and if we're not willing to trust another, if we're not willing to trust God, then, then that's the bad kind of doubt. So we need to be real, because I think we're all Thomas, sometimes at least, sometimes. Thomas's reply, oh, about time you showed up, Take, lift up your uh, tunic there, I'm sticking my hand in the hole. That's not how he responds. He simply says, my Lord and my God. By the way, that's a real difficult passage for people who deny Jesus is divine. Uh, in the Bible, all the books of the New Testament show Jesus' divinity, something that's at the very beginning. It doesn't evolve. And what's quite amazing is that you see, John was probably written in the 90s when Domitian was the emperor of Rome. And one thing the, the emperor of Rome did is he liked to be called Dominus et Deus. That's not Dominus, but Dominus is the Lord <laughs> and God. And yet, Jesus is Lord and God. The Romans like to portray themselves on their coins as holding the seven stars in their hand. In Revelation, Jesus holds the seven stars in his hand. Oh, there's so many claims to Jesus' divinity. Here, Thomas could only worship. So the key to flourishing is realizing exactly who Jesus is. And Thomas gets it. He's bold, as I mentioned before. Now he's worked through that doubt, and there's a strong, and I think a credible tradition, that he relocated to India in the 50s, that is about two decades later, where he preached the word and where he was also martyred. That's Thomas. Jesus says, blessed, uh, he says to him, to Thomas, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's my position. I've never seen Jesus' body. I had no opportunity to look or ever touch his wound. But do we have to have signs and wonders? 
Many people say, without signs and wonders, you can't believe. I think it's actually the opposite. Jesus discourages us to rely on signs and wonders. And to demand a sign or a wonder is a sign of weak faith. Well, that's a whole other topic. But Jesus realizes that, and John realizes as he's written this gospel, that most people hearing this gospel, most Christians in most centuries, will not have direct access to some mind-numbing miracle, though some do, God still does miracles. But for most people, that's not going to be the normal experience. But we can believe through this testimony. Blessed uh, are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's one of the many Beatitudes in the New Testament. First Peter assumes, back to First Peter one last time, it assumes that we have not seen Jesus. But even though we've not seen him, we believe in him. And even though we do not see him now, we are filled with a glorious and inexpressible joy for receiving the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Beautiful passage. Before we take the communion, and you'll, you should have one of these cups, uh, one of these, and there'll be a song too, but let me just share a few thoughts before we pray. I look at Jesus before Holy Week and all through Holy Week. I see him keeping his word, going all the way to the cross, completely trustworthy. And even on the cross, he refuses to come down. Yes, he could have called legions of angels to protect himself. He could have come down, but he did it. Yet the cross was not the last word. The end of the Gospels is not Good Friday. If it were, it would not be called Good Friday. It would be called Bad Friday. I'm not quite sure. Easter Sunday would follow. And let's think of that as we pray. Lord, we are truly grateful that you died and rose. Help us to not just live in the pain of Friday or the silence and confusion of Saturday, but to embrace the light and the joy and the victory of Sunday, of Easter Sunday, and for the bread and wine that represent the body and blood of Christ, which we now receive. We also thank you. Amen.